I'm Greg Wheatley, and my guest today on Inside Wheaton is Dr. Lee Joyner. Lee is Associate Professor of Music at the Wheaton College Conservatory. Been here for a number of years, and uh, Lee, it's great to have you here. Thanks, Greg. First time uh, we've sat down, I think, at it. Well, I take that back. I think you and uh, Dr. Whitaker and I did an interview one time in another venue. That's right, we did. And we'll talk about uh, your love of improvisation, which that was all about. But first time here on Inside Wheaton, so yes. good to have yeah. you here. Thank you. Colleague over in the conservatory, and we could talk about that. Right. But we're here to talk about your work with violin. You've been here at Wheaton College for 30 plus? 31 years. 31 years. Came as a teacher in violin. Has that always been your hat? Yes. Uh, when I started, I did both violin and viola, all of the, the students, and I taught all the string-related courses that are required. And now, you know, we are richer in numbers and richer in faculty, and now I, I uh, just teach violin. And I teach a few classes, uh, an improvisation class and a string lit class every other year. Hmm. But uh, and then I, I kind of manage or uh, supervise the the string area endeavors. And uh, that includes too, I think, um, taking care of some of the orchestral sectionals. It uh, does. You still are doing that? Right. Yeah, right. So you really, uh, your your stamp is on a lot of these string players <laughs> around here. That's that's for sure. Uh, you know, maybe start there because um, anybody that has heard the Wheaton Orchestra, the symphony orchestra here, for a college this size, I am consistently really blown away by the quality of mm. our orchestra. Um Talk about the string players that, that feed that orchestra, your work with them, and mm, how mm -hmm. does a school of Wheaton's size get a sound like that orchestra consistently gets? It's a good question. Um, I marvel at it at times, too. Um, one of the things that's very fun to see is how much the orchestra improves during the year. If you were to hear them in their first rehearsal, yeah. um, the difference between that and the concert is remarkable. And so there's a, there is a uh, discipline and a respect for the endeavor built in here. You know, as a Juilliard student, uh, we were all thinking we were headed to be soloists. And so uh, orchestra was something we went and did somewhat grudgingly. Even teachers mm -hmm. would not necessarily encourage you right. to invest very much right. in that. So that's a part of it. Uh, another part of it is we do have really good students interested in coming here, both music majors and non-music majors. And I think, you know, we never know one year to the next what non-majors are going to show up, but there are people that come to Wheaton because of what Wheaton represents and the academic standards. And they've played instruments through high school or, you know, some of them, you know, right. started at age uh, four but they, or something. But they might they, be a political science major. Exactly, yeah. but they want to keep it going. And that's actually, I think, part of the reason that some students choose Wheaton is mm -hmm. because they can keep the music going. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit, Lee, about the, the discipline of music. And I'm thinking not just the playing and the technique, but um, I, a student coming and, and playing serious orchestral literature mm -hmm. um, Talk about that discipline and what it what it does to a person. Well, that's that's an interesting question because there are different disciplines in the solo area and in, in chamber music and orchestral. I mean, orchestral playing has disciplines that are built into the system of needing to submit to the people in the front of your section. Uh, the people in the front of the section are following the conductor. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, for orchestra work, well those relationships have to work well. Um, a person, to play the violin well, one has to be disciplined in their practice and in the way they take care of their body, even. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things I would say about violin playing is it, it involves the whole person. And so one could even say there are disciplines in relation to how we're taking care of our our spiritual life, our souls, because you can't hide when you play. And sometimes when I'm working with students and I'm wanting, I'm sensing something is missing. Sometimes it's there's stuff going on in their life, you know. And so, um, so there's that. Um, yeah, maybe let's let's talk about that a minute because maybe unlike a lot of other disciplines, mathematics, social sciences. Uh, there's something about music that's a, at the core of our personhood, isn't there? There is. Yeah, yeah. and the players, the, the performers that we um, 
are are drawn to are the ones that you know they, they let you in somehow or they're 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 being vulnerable they are there, there aren't so many barriers for them. And, you know, I think we're probably all about trying to, just like in our spiritual lives, you know, remove the weeds and the things that inhibit. But I would certainly say that, you know, even motivation for students, you know, well, some of them are not sure why they're doing it or whether it's a, a noble pursuit. And it's interesting to see when they take a hold of that and um, – say, yeah, I, the Lord is calling me to do this. This is a worthwhile thing. I can, I can honor God in doing this. It's okay to spend that time in my practice room. I'm not being selfish yeah, yeah. because I'm, I'm doing that. I'm preparing. You know, so there's a, there's, I mean, learning to play an instrument well is a lifetime yeah. endeavor. I'm still working <laughs> at it, you know, and so that fascinates me how, you know, the whole picture. I think I asked, uh, Several months ago, when I had Dan Somerville across this mm. table, I think I asked him a similar question. It's it's one that's quite interesting to me. Uh, when you when you take this whole artistic endeavor from a Christian vantage point, a Christian perspective, and you say, "All right, um, I'm not when I play when I play a Mendelssohn symphony, or uh, when I play a maybe Beethoven's better because Mendelssohn at least has some sacred connections. Mm -hmm. When I play a Beethoven symphony, when I play Wagner, for goodness sake." Um, there's no religious text. In fact, in some cases, with say a Wagner, you've got some maybe questionable things going mm -hmm. on there. How is that a Christian discipline? How is that part of my spiritual offering or um, my discipline as a Christian? That is a good question. That's a, that's a tough one. That's probably a, that's an hour's worth of discussion. It, I think it is. Um, the well, I mean, with Wagner, I mean that opens up all sorts of questions. Can a Christian with, play Wagner? Let's start there. Yeah, I, um, I, I would say yes. I mean, I I don't play in orchestras. I don't play at the Lyric Opera, so I don't wrestle with this. I have played. Uh, have I played a Wagner opera? I don't know if I have. You know, I start, I went to the, attended the Ring mm -hmm. when I was here. Mm -hmm. So if I uh, I am um, when the Lyric did it, the Ring series, and Wagner is creating a world of sound, of text, of of visual. Um, I, I, certainly, it reflects his outlook on the world. I would say spending time on that is getting to know a creature, what a creature made in God's image has has created. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we could raise the same question about doing lots of things yes, right. as human beings, right. we need to understand what others are thinking and doing and how does this reflect mm -hmm. what's going on in our culture. So I suppose that would be maybe the biggest part of my answer is I have, in some ways I have a duty to know what fellow musicians are thinking and doing. If I'm going to have any relationship with them, I, you know, uh, certainly, there are things that I need to stay away from and dismiss, but um, I think our relationship, our responsibilities, the way we connect with others as musicians, you know, it is part of our ministry in, in a yeah. sense. You've just come back. Uh, you told me from the East Coast, where you, were, uh, of all things, attended a, a bow making conference. Now you know you're in the presence of a musical nerd when. Uh, <laughs> When they tell you they've enjoyed a bow making uh, oh, yeah. workshop, right? Uh, so talk about that, and and I want that to maybe lead us into a discussion about uh, early instruments and your sure. interest in those. Sure. So. Okay, um, I I've always been interested in say the music of of Bach, an unaccompanied violin, and um, I've done a couple of recitals while I've been here at the College of all solo violin music because I wanted to trace the way the violin is used over time because you can see the development of the technique of the instrument mm -hmm. through pieces that are written for it. So um, once you start down that path and you look, uh, say, at box markings, in a, because we have a very good autograph in box handwriting of his solo violin works. Okay, and then you look at these bowings that, hmm, with this modern bow, I'm having trouble with this. Hmm. 
this doesn't quite work. And then I've had the opportunity to play some period bows. There are not many existing bows. Bows are fragile, and probably early on they were just made to be discarded. But um, So there are some that go all the way back? To there are some that go mm. quite back. Not a lot, mm-hmm. but, but the, in treatises there are also pictures and dimensions and discussions about that, and they were different in different countries. Mm. Um, so the first inkling to me that this was an area that I wanted to learn about is, is playing the music of Bach on a different bow and thinking, oh, this bowing suddenly works. Mm. I like what I'm getting. And then you realize that their violins were a little different. They were strung on gut. Um, the neck went into the instrument a little, little different way. They were not, they didn't need to be as loud. I mean, they, no, right. they weren't written for concert halls. Okay, so then when you have gut strings that are very sensitive, and these days people play Bach at a, a lower pitch. Um, I mean, there were different pitches in different parts of, of Europe at different times, but the strings are more uh, sensitive, the bow is more sensitive, and it opens up possibilities. Hmm. And so when you once you start down that path, you realize, oh, now what about in Mozart and Beethoven? What was the equipment like then? And and I saw a DVD of that um, famous pianist Malcolm Bilson did on the development of the piano, and he demonstrated different iterations of the piano, and you realize that the forte piano was a softer instrument, mm-hmm. and there were different kinds that made different sounds, and and or even the grand piano, different people preferred different pianos. Now we have a steel frame, cross-strung instrument. The sounds are more... You get a lot more of them for what you they more, more yeah, it's a stronger more. sound. They ring longer. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's not always a plus. Mm-hmm. And for violin, when you play with an instrument that's louder and rings longer, y- you've got to do something different. So mm-hmm. then the bows developed in order, you know, larger halls, different instruments they're playing with. I heard uh, one of the, this bow maker at the workshop um is very well known for making historical bows, especially. And Jaap Schroeder, who has been an early proponent of the uh, uh, historically informed performance, is one of his clients. And his opinion is that the piano has driven a lot of this. Hmm. And so when the piano changes and you're going to have a violin and piano sonata, yeah, sure. right. the violin's got to change. It's a, it's a pair. The, yeah, All right. That is very interesting. I, and, and Lee, that takes us to this whole area of what, has become known as performance practice or period practice. Um, I was probably back when I was a youngster, this whole thing started taking off. People started getting inter- interested in, you know, well, maybe we shouldn't sing Messiah with 300 people on stage. Exactly. I grew up going to University of Michigan performances of the Messiah with the cast of thousands on the yes. stage. And it was, it was gorgeous. It was right. wonderful. But then they started saying, hey, wait a second. Um, but it raises the question of, should we try to go back and do things the way Bach did them, the way Handel did them, or should we say, no, today is today, we're going to play their music, but we're going to do it with our forces. Uh, is, is there a philosophical argument still going on about that? Um, perhaps a little. I think less so. Um, I've been reading a book on... Uh, the history of performance practice or historically informed performance, I think, is what uh, people are calling it mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. And it actually started in the 60s with and a somewhat of a protest movement. And, of course, in the 60s, that was that, what you that, did. That's what, what you did. <laughs> so the person who wrote this book, he said part of his and he was starting his career then. He said part of his protest was saying he wanted to study harpsichord for his keyboard major instrument rather mm-hmm. than piano. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then he goes on to talk about how then they started changing some instruments and realizing. And actually, I learned in this book that Paul Hindemith is one of the first people who said. I think we better examine the forces that need to be used really? to play these pieces. Huh. I, I wouldn't have thought it would go back that far. Right. He was really prophetic in right. that way. Right. And so now um, they're, especially in England, but uh, around the world, there's more interest in period instruments. And, you know, when I turn on the radio and listen to classical or uh, Baroque music, let's mm-hmm. say, more often than not, the recordings are on 
period instruments. Right. True. And interesting, last summer I attended uh, the Early M Music Vancouver, which is one of the primary summer places, a wonderful festival. And uh, I heard a story of someone talking about one of our prominent concert violinists saying, you know, I don't buy any of this early stuff. And uh, one of the historically informed performance people said, okay, let's do a test. You get your forces together and you play, I think it may have been a Bach Brandenburg concerto, and all prepare it too. We'll put them on the same concert and then we'll let people <laughs> vote and say mm -hmm. which they like the best. Yeah. Well, the historically informed performance was the one that was chosen. It has become embedded in our ears now, hasn't it? It has. Over about a generation. Right. Um, it tempos, have, uh, faster Abs tempos. Absolutely. Clearer textures that let mm -hmm. things through, lighter. Right. Um, and maybe more varieties of sounds. Not as loud, mm -hmm. but um, more clarity and... That, and also, along with this, goes uh, for a different sense in what phrasing is about. I mean, yeah. one of the big education points for me is, well, um, you know, I, I grew up wanting to create long singing lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's really good for certain things. But when I start reading some of the treatises and I read in Leopold Mozart that every slur in music implies a diminuendo, hmm. Oh, well, that means you don't play, you know, sustain full you volume through. the phrases a little bit. Yeah. 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 And it's the music, as I've worked with that, you know, I, I'm liking what I get. Hmm. Um, and then you can see when Beethoven comes along, you can see things change during the time he's writing. And you can see, you start to see crescendos that mm -hmm. go through slurs, and so you realize, okay, things things are changing. And around that time, the bow was changing, too. So all of these things are tied together. Tell me, we're, we're just about two minutes left here. Um, tell me about students here, what you like about it. You're, I know you're headed out of here today, in fact, to go have a lesson right, right. with somebody. You spend a lot of time in that practice room. Um, I do. What, what, do you, what, what do you like about that relationship? A lot happens for students during these four years. Um, musically, personally, capturing a vision for where the Lord might want them to go. I enjoy being part of that process. And I listen to auditions when they come in, and I hear about their background, and I see what they've done. I listen to them talk about what they think they'd like to do. I watch them as they start getting involved with the different aspects of music and with the liberal arts curriculum, and I see things start to merge. They, you know, the different gift giftedness, and in a studio, see, I usually I may have 12, 14 violinists in my studio, and I have people of different majors, performance majors, music ed majors. I might have some uh, some bachelor of arts music majors, and I like the fact that they're all there together, rubbing shoulders, mm, right. and. Uh, I try to have them call out the giftedness of one another that they see because I really think that it's, you know, they're learning how God has made them and what desires he's given them and how that might then translate beyond Wheaton. And so th that's, that's a fun process. I enjoy the one-on-one -on -one relationships and, you know, we talk – yeah, we talk about everything under the sun, it Yeah, it's seems. not just music, is it? Yeah, no, it can't. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. Lee, it's great to have you here. Thank you so Thank much you, for Greg. visiting well, with us. Thanks for your yeah. work here at Wheaton. Yeah. And by the way, let me encourage you, if you're hearing this and thinking, boy, that sounds like a place I'd like to uh, send a student of mine, um, do check it out. Go to wheaton.edu slash conservatory, and uh, you can see all kinds of good information about the Conservatory of Music. Dr. Lee Joyner is Associate Professor of Music in the Conservatory. And for Inside Wheaton, I'm Greg Wheatley.